Hey, it's your old pal Lucid Stew again, and this is the Stew's News 2023 Year in Review, where we will look at everything of note that happened in American High Speed Rail during 2023, and I'll tell you what to look for in the coming year. Let's check it out. We'll work our way west to east, starting with Cascadia Ultra High Speed Ground Transportation in the Pacific Northwest. The start of 2023 saw Cusagat off the radar as the Washington State Department of Transportation sat around doing stuff like this and putting bad low-res graphics into PDFs. In June, a review of previous studies was presented to the Washington State Legislature. Among the findings, the thing will likely cost 50% more than previously estimated. They're now looking at 36 to $63 billion. The thing won't be as fast either as the review concluded 250 miles per hour in service wasn't realistic. In response, Washington quickly scrambled to wait for funding of yet another study. August saw the politicians coming out of the woodwork backing a $198 million FSP grant to fund the study that could not wait. That's a running theme from August to December on all the projects we'll look at. When FSP national grants were announced in December, Cascadia Ultra High Speed Ground Transportation got nothing. The project did, however, receive a Corridor ID grant, which sets it up for better success with grants in the future. However, there are 68 other corridors in that grant pipeline program now. If you don't know what an FSP National or a Corridor ID are, check out my video about the grants in the card above. Link is also in the description. In 2024, Cascadia will be looking to bounce back from this temporal setback. Perhaps they will receive study funding in a year or two, or the entities involved will fund it themselves. California High Speed Rail started the year on a positive note with $4.2 billion in bond funds released from legislative captivity, and it looking like they had just enough funds identified to get service operational between Merced and Bakersfield by 2030. However, in March, the California High Speed Rail Authority released its 2023 project update, revealing a stunner. Merced to Bakersfield would be 8 to 10 billion more than they previously thought. An obscure YouTube creator named Lucid Stew, brought to a boil by this mismanagement, promptly put up a couple of videos on the subject. People liked them so much he's still putting out California High Speed Rail videos 10 months later. Things went from bad to worse as California was hit by an unusually wet winter, putting several miles of California high-speed rail construction zones underwater. This resulted in delays and cost overruns. On the bright side in May, the authority completed the Cedar Viaduct in Fresno. This is one of the largest structures in the initial operating segment, and they had been working on it since 2016. In June, they got a $20 million raise grant for the Fresno Station site. August saw an RFQ for train set procurement, starting the multi-year process of acquiring train sets for testing. September saw California High Speed Rail receiving a $202 million grant for grade separations in Shafter, California. In November, the authority restarted its track and overhead systems procurement process with an RFQ, this is a six-year contract to design tracking systems phased with construction of the right-of-way. In December, California High Speed Rail received the largest FSP national grant at $3.07 billion. This will help pay for the aforementioned track, overhead systems, test, train sets, and design work on the Merced and Bakersfield extensions of the original 119-mile segment. In 2024, we can expect the 2024 business plan, which has the possibility of updating both projected cost and ridership. The authority will need to continue to figure out where the remainder of the Merced to Bakersfield funding will come from. The bigger elephant in the room is the funding gap for phase one, San Francisco to Anaheim, which currently sits at about $76 billion. The authority is expecting environmental clearance on the Palmdale to Burbank section, and this year may 
see the first California high-speed rail tracks installed. Also partially in California, coming into 2023, Brightline West was looking to shake off COVID and get the project going. In February, they came to an agreement with California about wildlife crossings to forward the environmental assessment. Around the same time, they lined up necessary labor union agreements. In April, they applied for a $3.75 billion FSP national grant. This broke precedent for Brightline because very little of Brightline Florida has been directly publicly financed. Also, at that time, they went public with a cost estimate hike from $10 to $12 billion. June saw a $25 million raise grant for the Victor Valley Station. In July, the environmental assessment for the planned section between Rancho Cucamonga and Victor Valley got a Fonzi, indicating the NEPA process was complete for that part. That was quickly followed up by re-evaluation of the rest. In November, the Surface Transportation Board cleared the project, that being the last major federal regulatory hurdle. In December, Brightline West received three of the $3.75 billion they were asking for from the FSP National Program. Overall, a pretty quick straight line of meeting goals, which gives hope that construction can go as quickly as planned. Also, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Siemens unveiling their American Pioneer 220 concept, a version of their Velaro Novo design, and the revelation of the rentable party car. All I can say is that Alstom better have a party car up their sleeves somewhere. In 2024, we will likely see the start of construction on Brightline West. It will probably take about six months for construction to start on the 218 miles of right away, but work at Brightline West properties in Victor Valley, Sloan, Nevada, and the Las Vegas station site could start sooner. As 2023 dawned, Texas Central Railroad found itself in a strange predicament. In 2022, Texas Central won an important decision from the Texas Supreme Court, which allows it to use eminent domain in acquisition of right of way. However, that same month, the CEO quit and the board disbanded. After that, the company leadership went underground and Texas Central headquarters was a ghost town. In May, Texas Central was back in headlines defending against Texas legislation that wanted to force transparency on the private project. The legislation failed. During August, one of the biggest U.S. high-speed rail stories of the year, Texas Central teamed up with Amtrak to try to get her done. Quiet after that, but in December, the Amtrak partnership bore fruit with a corridor ID grant that got Texas Central back on track. In 2024, look for Central Texas residents to continue playing Texas Central Whack-A-Bowl. Closely related, Dallas-Fort Worth high-speed transportation came into 2023, working on phase one of a two-phase study. In May, phase one of the study completed, which gave them a preferred route and a tech choice, high-speed rail. Surprisingly, they did not choose Hyperloop. The project received a Corridor ID grant in December as part of a broader scheme to connect Fort Worth, Dallas, and Houston, as the project does consider interconnectivity with Texas Central. In 2024, the North Central Texas Council of Governments would like to wrap up their study and environmental assessment of the project, hopefully resulting in a FONSI by year's end to complete the NEPA process. If they can manage all that, it will put them about 18 months behind Brightline West in the process. The Kansas City project started 2023 as a gleam in someone's eye. In June, the city put out a request for expression of interest to build a 21-mile high-speed transportation line of some sort between Kansas City International Airport and downtown Kansas City ahead of the 2026 FIFA World Cup. 
In October, the Department of Transportation partnered with the city on an emerging projects agreement, which is meant to funnel transit dollars their way. The cost for the 21 mile project, $10.5 billion. In 2024, it looks like the project will remain a gleam in the city's eye as apparently no one was interested. Moving now from a very small area to a very big area. Chicago Hub started 2023 with a lot of territory to improve. In June, Lincoln Service and Texas Eagle Service schedules were improved by 15 minutes to reflect a speed increase to 110 miles per hour on their routes through Illinois. By August, a large group of polities within the Chicago Hub region were pushing for $837 million in FSP grants to improve Chicago Union Station and unlock access to other lines in the Chicago area for Amtrak. That would provide long-term potential to improve speeds even further on routes to the south and southeast. However, come December, the Chicago area received only $93 million for Chicago Union improvements. One bright side was that 20 different routes in the Chicago Hub Network got Corridor ID grants. However, all were conventional rail, so don't expect anything above 110 miles per hour. For 2024, it's still possible some of the Chicago improvements will come from a mega grant. Otherwise, it might be a long year for Chicago Hub. Still technically in Chicago Hub territory, Michigan started 2023 off the radar. In May, the state legislature was considering $100 million in state grants toward high-speed rail projects. The following month, the legislature passed down a watered-down $20 million package. Better than nothing, but $20 million doesn't buy much. Michigan also had a project within the chip offerings to double-track part of Amtrak's right-of-way out there that could have cut half an hour off a Chicago to Detroit trip. However, that money was not granted in December with the FSP national announcements. Michigan did get four corridor ID grants for conventional rail. It's worth mentioning that Michigan is one of the few places in the country Amtrak owns an appreciable amount of right-of-way outside of the NEC. 2024, though, doesn't appear to hold much promise. Tennessee was another one off the radar at the beginning of 2023 after Tennessee and Georgia sat on a Tier 1 environmental impact statement pertaining to the proverbial Chattanooga Choo Choo for six years. In June, the Tennessee Advisory Commission on Intergovernmental Relations recommended applying to the Corridor ID program and studying new passenger rail from Nashville to Atlanta. When December rolled around, Tennessee got their Corridor ID grant, but for Memphis to Atlanta. This grant does, however, indicate conventional rail. 2024 will see Tennessee working its way through the Corridor ID process. Looking at the Atlanta to Chattanooga environmental impact statement, the technology is still up in the air. The study suggests faster than conventional travel, so perhaps Class 7, like the new Brightline route between Orlando and Coco, we'll see. Speaking of Brightline Florida, I know it's not high-speed rail, but I'll explain in a bit. Brightline started 2023 working on extending their service from West Palm Beach to Orlando. Throughout the year, we enjoyed the saga of the St. Lucie Bridge in Stewart, Florida. This is a low movable bridge that has many conflicts with waterborne vehicles. In August, Brightline delayed their Orlando launch, which caused some concern. However, they managed to start service in September and all was forgiven. This service includes new Class 7 track rated at 125 miles per hour, making it the fastest U.S. passenger train outside of the Northeast Corridor. In December, Florida got two Corridor ID grants, one of which covers Brightline's future expansion to Tampa. Also in December, it was leaked that Florida would be getting a mega grant to cover a replacement of the St. Lucie Bridge, so it looks like that story will have a happy ending. 
The tantalizing question for Brightline Florida in 2024 is, will the Tampa extension be class 7, 125 mile per hour rated, or maybe class 8, 160 miles per hour like parts of the NEC? Maybe we'll find out. Moving up the coast to Northeast Maglev, the project started 2023 with a paused NEPA process, local opposition, and a lot of questions. The company spent a good part of the year lobbying Maryland politicians. In November, a lawsuit involving their proposed Baltimore station site was resolved to their benefit. So in 2024, might this mean that Northeast Maglev, the Japanese-backed project that proposes to run 300 mile per hour levitating trains between DC and New York City might restart its NEPA process? And now the big daddy of them all, the Northeast Corridor and Acela service. At the beginning of 2023, everyone was anticipating the arrival of the sexy new 160 mile per hour Alstom Avelia Liberty trains into revenue service. Also on the horizon, Amtrak's switch to aero service and a lot of nice, clean, modern equipment. NEC affiliates were looking forward to fat stacks from the $24 billion set aside for the NEC in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. This would allow them to work through a not-so-healthy backlog of projects. The NEC was also struggling with ridership somewhat due to COVID. Ridership was at 75% of its 2019 peak. The question for mass transit around the country is if people will return to their old transportation habits after the lockdowns. NEC started the year off right in February with a $292 million mega grant for the Hudson Yards Concrete Casing Section 3. This is work necessary for the new Hudson River tunnels they want to build out there. The first half of the year saw progress on a number of projects in the backlog using state and federal money not associated with the FSP program. A setback in May, Amtrak announced the much anticipated Alstom Avelia Liberties would be delayed in service until 2024. In July, the NEC got huge money. A $6.9 billion FTA capital investment grant for the $17 billion Hudson River Tunnels project. September was the end of Amtrak's fiscal year. Amtrak reported fiscal year 2023 ridership at 97% of its 2019 peak and passenger miles at 90% of peak. So far, fiscal year 2024 is doing gangbusters business. Train riders are back on the NEC. In October, the Amtrak Office of Inspector General revealed it was quite likely the Alstom Avelia Liberties would be delayed again, as the current fleet of Acela Express trains rots before our eyes. Alstom promptly became public enemy number one on X and Instagram. Also in November, the FSP NEC grants were announced. These totaled $9 billion. Most of that was distributed to projects attempting to replace Victorian era bridges in an effort to convince everyone that Northeast Corridor is modern infrastructure. In December, the massively expensive $17 billion effort to add a new tunnel and two more tracks under the Hudson River between New Jersey and Manhattan got underway. 2024 will see a lot of design and construction, however, most of the big projects that just got funded won't be complete until the mid-2030s. Also, the big funding trend for FSP NEC in 2024 should be big projects on big train stations. The biggest question of the coming year? Will we see Alstom Avelia Liberties in revenue service or will they slip to 2025? That does it for 2023. 2024 holds a lot of promise, including the possibility that I will be bringing you updates of Brightline West construction from the field. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. If you did, please give it a like. 
If you have any opinions about this video or just high speed rail in general, please share them in the comments. More Federal Railroad Administration High Speed Rail Corridor videos on the way. More High Speed Rail City Pair videos as well. Another Stu's News on the last Friday of the month. And keep an eye out for Brightline West construction updates around the middle part of the year, fingers crossed. But that's all for now. Until next time, I'll see you on that big beautiful freeway.